This summer, members of the Green Party of England and Wales will be voting to elect new members of the Green Party executive, commonly known as GPAX. Now, members of GPAX are elected to specific portfolios, and today I'm joined by one of the candidates in the internal communications coordinator race. Before I introduce them, I have one thing to ask of you, which is that you scroll down right now and hit subscribe. With that out of the way, I'm delighted today to be joined by Helen Geek. Helen, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you, and I'm very grateful to you for fitting me in on a Saturday. <laughs> Not at all. Uh, so to kick things off, hopefully nice and easily, um, could you tell our viewers why you're standing to be the Green Party's next internal communications coordinator? Yes, well, I think over the past few years, I've had a lot of different experiences within the party. Um, I've been a parliamentary candidate three times, and I've ended up in 2019 with the best result against a Conservative incumbent in the whole country. Um, I've also just stood down from being a district councillor in Mid Suffolk. Um, and of course, Mid Suffolk is famously now a green majority council. But historically, it's always been a very conservative area. So I, I live in this incredibly conservative area. And I grew up, I mean, I, gosh, I grew up in what's now uh, Jacob Rees Mogg's constituency. So I've got a slightly different perspective, perhaps, to, 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 um, to some other members who are active within the party. Um, I, I've, I've noticed that the voting in the past that often we've got a, a lot of um, people standing from cities and I think that I've got a different experience to, to bring to the executive that we the, the rural areas are absolutely so full of potential for the Green Party. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the portfolio then so how do you think the Green Party can improve uh, its internal communications? Well I think really we've got a bit of a disconnect between what people do at the local level um, where our comms tends to be quite informal, quite a lot of it's based on word of mouth and, um, and, and people knowing each other. And then what people do at the, at the national level, things like the policy working groups and the special interest groups and conference and so on. Um, those at the, at the local level, they're really at the sharp end of getting councillors elected, but they're incredibly dependent on people who do put in that work at the national level to get the basic framework right. Um, so they need to talk to each other. And at the moment, the, the, I'm not sure that they do. So we need to capitalise really on, on that local knowledge and that best practice nationally. But we can't do that unless we know about it. So the communication's got to go up and down and also horizontally, of course. Um, so more communication between local parties at the regional level would help too. Um, and I think this was really shown for me the other day when I, I went to um, a couple of the recent policy fest sessions um, and I was really surprised at how few people there were there. And I wondered whether it was either because they didn't know it was happening um, or more likely, I think it was because they didn't know why they should go, why they should get involved. And they maybe thought, what is it to do with me? Um, and and that's that's one of the things that I'd like to change. I'd like to integrate those those two strands of the party um, and, and make sure that our comms are noticed, that are that they're acted on um, when they're things like emails, but also things like the website. Sometimes you have to know, even in the members area, you have to know what you're looking for before you can find it. You need to know the right words and it just needs to be a bit more accessible. And so one of the areas that the Internal Communications Coordinator is responsible for is um, strengthening the communication between the Green Party executive and the membership. Now, I think if you were to speak to uh, probably most members of the party and ask them uh, who, what the Green Party executive is, who sits on it and what they do, I think most people would respond with a slightly confused face and not much in the way of knowledge or understanding of what that body is and does. So how could you see yourself improving the way that GPEX communicates with the membership? Well, I think one of the things is we need to start as we mean to go on. So we need to start with a really easy kind of cheat sheet for new members so that they know who does what, um, how the party works, where they might like to go with their membership of the party. Um, I, I also think we need slightly better kind of calendars and newsletters. You know, Green World is brilliant, but again, you have to know it's there. You have to go and find it. Um, a, a kind of a, a quick digest of weekly news, friendly news, um, would be would be great. I, I get the morning briefing, but I think it's too detailed for most people. Um, but then you see, those are those are my thoughts, and I'm conscious that what works for one person doesn't work for another. And I would also quite like 
um, to 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 look at all the surveys we have um, and perhaps commission a new one to get a kind of baseline of what members wh which members know what things what they'd like to know what they need to know and how they'd like to get it and one of the other areas that the this this role in particular is responsible for is overseeing the party's fundraising um uh, obviously in collaboration with the staff team so i wanted to ask you what you think the party needs to do to ensure that its uh political ambitions are met by its fundraising capacity yeah well, there's no easy answers there um i think i think that it's quite tempting to think that the solution from looking at other political parties the solution is the big fundraisers it's the big donors um but major donors they're problematic in themselves um, I think that particularly the Green Party tends to attract a, a higher degree of scrutiny and criticism than other parties because we point out that other parties are influenced by uh, their donors' interests. So once we've pointed that out, then people look at us and you know we're held to a higher standard. I don't think that's I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think everybody should be held to a higher standard, but but it means that there are risks in relying on major donors. We need to minimize those risks and be aware of them. Um, and I think it's worth us trying to foster a conversation about state funding of political parties. We need to frame it in the right way though. I think once you talk about state funding, people say, oh, well, you just, you want money for your party. What we want to say is instead, we want to take donors' interests and 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 the ensuing possible corruption out of politics. We, we, we need to frame the problem and give an answer um, but but that is kind of that's quite a lot of blue sky thinking. I mean, on a on an everyday level, something that's within our control and we can do straight away. I think that because most of our money comes from membership um, subscriptions and top up donations, um, we need to be aware that that comes in cycles that general elections make everybody think about politics and we get more members at the time of a general election. Little spikes at local election time, but it's it's general elections that 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 give us that um, kind of springboard. So um, so we need to fix our budgets when with an awareness of those kinds of cycles. We need to we need to capitalize on on the general election and then be aware that in the next year we won't be able to rely on that as well. So we need to tailor what we can do to fit what's coming in. And so I want to talk to you now about some of the kind of wider responsibilities of GPEX, because obviously, although you're studying for a particular portfolio, you would hold the responsibilities that all executive members have. The first area I wanted to talk to you about is uh, sort of following on from that is finances. So GPEX is the body within the party that's responsible for the party's financial well-being and managing and overseeing its finances. So I wanted to ask you what experience you have of um, overseeing uh, large, difficult, complex uh, budgets. Well, first of all, I've been an opposition councillor for the last four years. Um, we had a, a, a large budget um, that we spent a great deal of time scrutinising. Mid Suffolk's got a slightly unusual budget. Uh, it runs a surplus and it has large investments that are uh, that, that are supposed to be income generating and are focused or were, uh, you know, have until now been been focused outside the district. So we raise our some of our money from outside the district we've spent a, a, so there are some structural um unusual things there and we've spent a lot of our time as the green group scrutinizing that budget so i've learned a most enormous amount over the last four years um i've also uh, all my working life i've been a trustee of various charities so i've got um wide experience from small to large of things like reserves and risk management and investments and um uh, and and reading accounts and auditing and so on and so forth the, the really essential things um and I, i'm well aware of the importance of transparency and accountability and so one of the other areas that gpex has responsibility for in parallel with the green party regional council gprc is um, the party's uh, political strategy and direction and ambition. I wanted to ask you what you think the Green Party needs to do right now to make sure that it can meet its political objectives and strategy. Well, I think that the field teams are absolutely crucial there. Um, put it, they they represent that little bit of investment that you need in order to to draw on all of the potential of the local parties. They're 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 a, a, a crucial. Um, thing to to deliver the 
the, the lowest level of the, the district council to build up to the county council and, um, and eventually to, to MPs. Um, we also need to keep our political strategy under review. Um, we, we need, like with the fundraising, we need to get into this kind of cycle of we have a general election, then we have a bit of a, uh, of a, of a lull and a regroup uh, in which we can fix some internal stuff. But then we've got to begin to turn outwards again and we've got to focus on the next elections, the county or the district, and then two years later, the other ones uh, building up to the next general election. Um, I, I mean, I'm aware that some elections happen every year, but but there are there are, there are bigger and smaller election years, and we must take the the um, opportunity of having those slight lulls to 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 look inwards and then immediately look outwards again. And I think GPEX is is not too bad at doing that because most of its people are councillors or ex councillors, and they know what it's like to to deliver at a local level. We've got to keep that localness you know the um think think local act global no think global act local that's we've absolutely got to keep on acting locally because that is the thing that absolutely embeds us in our communities and because uh, um at an electoral at a general election we're so dependent on what you might call the air war you know that that um that the major parties uh get much more coverage in the media um, we don't tend to get that. So we and that that sways the situation a great deal. What we can control is the ground war. And we are so good at that. We've, we've got to keep our eye on uh, on what's going on at a local level all the time. Um, the other thing we've got really to do to 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 underpin the political strategy is that we've got to be able to move quickly enough to react to events. Um, and that I think is dependent on our party structure, and we have we've got to finish the um, the the we, we've got to get to a point with the constitution and the holistic review where we know that we're fit for purpose and we're agile enough to to deal with um, with with what with what comes in. But having said that, I am conscious that then again, it all comes down at the bottom to fundraising, that it's all very well to say this, but if we haven't got the resources to do it, then we all want it, but but who's going to deliver it? Uh, we've got to keep an eye on that. So the final sort of serious question I have for you before I move on to my slightly less serious ones that I'd like to finish on is around an issue that's been pretty prevalent in the party for the last few years. And this relates to uh, transphobia within the Green Party. So what I wanted to ask you is, as a member of GPAX, how would you see yourself working to help tackle transphobia in the party? Well, I think for, to, to begin with, uh, we, we, we've obviously got to really clearly say that there's no place for transphobia in the party. Having said that, that, of course, is an easy thing to say. And obviously, equally clearly, it, it's, it's, it's not enough. Um, I think one of the things we've got to do is think about how we frame the issues. Um, because the, the, the achieving equity is not, it's not simple. Um, it's, it's not a it's not a zero sum game. It's not a binary process. It's really complicated and it involves individual people who all need to be treated as individuals. Um, everybody on all sides needs to remember that there are human beings involved here and we need to be kind and we need to be flexible and we need to be understanding. And above all, we need to be tolerant. Um, acknowledging that there's a problem um, I think is, is acknowledging that hurt has been caused and we need to, to come together and, and, and heal. And that's, I do feel that, that no one side should be tolerant of intolerance. We've all got to absolutely um, pull together and know that the, the, the big prize is the, is the environment and that green politics have got to, we, we have, they've got to triumph, otherwise we're all, you know, we're going to hell in a handcart. Um, and I, I know that this is a matter for wider society as well, but I do feel that the Green Party ought to be um, in the vanguard. We should be modelling the right way forward, um, because if we can't do it ourselves, you know, we, we can hardly expect anybody else to. We are the party of kindness and tolerance and we've got to we've got to model that. Um, I, I think, though, that um, one of our problems may be um, education that. Um, a lot of people aren't used to thinking about these issues. It's it's kind of caught quite a few people by surprise. 
um, there's a lot of education to do at all levels. Um, and, and I include me in that. I would like to think of myself as a trans ally, but I certainly need to find out more and understand more. Um, and, and I think if hearing hearing more stories, actually, this is a this is a situation where where this, where storytelling is is a good thing. A, a non judgmental way of hearing stories would be would be really good. So I promised I'd move on to my less serious questions and I will. So the first of them is what is your favourite and your least favourite Green Party policy? Fav favourite is a bit, uh, <laughs> I think the most important, anything that is the most important is what tackles the climate crisis uh, the most effectively and fastest. So, uh, and given that nearly all of our policies are directed towards that it's really difficult um i mean that's that's energy that's transport that's agriculture um i think we've got some great agricultural policies but i think um something that i've been interested in for for, for years and i uh, and everything i think about always seems to come back to this and um and also it makes the most difference immediately to a lot of people's lives is our housing policy um it would make huge strides towards where we need to be on the climate crisis if we could if we could implement our housing policy to, to get our housing stock used um, to provide cheap homes and warm homes and secure homes it, um, it, it has to underpin everything things like the universal basic income that that stands or falls on the shoulders of a housing policy you cannot you cannot um, it's, there's no point in putting extra money into people's pockets if it's simply as siphoned out to a private landlord again. It, 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 it's the housing benefit, local housing allowance problem in, in absolute spades. We've got to fix that before we can, um, before we can effectively work towards a, a, a UBI. Oh, least. No, she didn't mention your least favourite there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, I've got a, I've, 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 I've got a least favourite which I have been banging on about for years, and and I know that this seems like a little tiny add-on. It's our heritage policy. Essentially, we haven't got one, and people have started saying to me, "Oh, yes, we have. Uh, we've got a heritage tourism policy." That is not the same thing. Um, and and again, it comes back a lot of the time to to housing and to buildings. We need to acknowledge that old buildings they're not just lovely. They've got a lot of embodiment bodied carbon in them. Um, they're, they're, they're good for well-being, for making us feel happy, but they're also, instead of um, replacing um, old buildings, we should be retrofitting and repairing them. Did, I mean, a lot of people don't know that if you replace the windows in a listed building, you don't have to pay VAT on them, on that. But if you repair the windows in a listed building, you do have to pay VAT. So, so our tax situation, our tax policy should be directed to finding what to, to encouraging good behaviour and discouraging bad behaviour. Um, and, and, and in the case of the AT unlisted buildings, it just isn't. So, so it's, it, it's, maybe you think it's, it's, a, it's a minor add-on, it's nice to have, but you know, my working life is in heritage and I feel I'm slightly embarrassed that, um, that we don't have a heritage policy. Plus the number of archaeologists that there are in the Green Party, I mean, Jenny Jones, um, her working life, a lot of that was spent as in archaeology and we really need to get our house in order. OK, next up is what book has most influenced your politics? Well, um, I think probably the one that I was reading at the time that I joined the Green Party, probably. Have I got my timeline right? I'm not really sure, but one that was really, really big and, and I recommend to as many people as I can as a kind of start off point is the spirit level. Um, by Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson, um, because um, that takes you that 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 shows you why social justice is crucial as an underpinning for things like the climate crisis, but um, for for everything, in fact, including the climate crisis. So it it takes you from really understandable common sense themes. It it it, it, it takes you from what you know to what you need to know. And then it takes you just a little step further forwards to, to kind of do myth busting. And because a lot of people think, well, inequality is not great for me because I'm at the bottom of the heap, but it must be great to be at the top of the heap. Well, no, it's not. It's not good for anybody. It's not good for those right at the top. And, and it, it's influenced every single bit of my thinking, including even going up to, um, to, to why I'm a Republican. Um, the kindest thing that we could do for the royal family would be to abolish the monarchy. I, I, it's obvious it's not good for us, but it's not good for them either. And on human rights grounds alone, we ought to be 
we ought to be abolishing the monarchy. And that's that's what the spirit levels taught me. Um, but but it's it's quite a general book. And uh, can I just recommend a couple of other really specific ones? Because um, the, there's a there's a great book that I haven't heard a lot of people talk about called Good Times, Bad Times by John Hills, who was the most amazing man. Um, and, and that, again, is a myth buster. It takes out the myths around um, around the welfare state. It pro provides all this really hard evidence to show that we all get a pretty much equal amount out of the welfare state. It's not a them and us situation. I mean, it's really useful in persuading people that that Green Party policies are are the right ones for practical reasons. And the other one is um, is one that I'm constantly picking off the shelf and trying trying as hard as I can to understand, um, which is prosperity without growth. I can't claim that I get it all, um, but uh, but it's it's so it's so useful to have there. You know, you feel like you've got somebody on the shelf who who knows what to do. And so you can always pick it off and try and understand a bit extra every time you start to get in a kind of, but how can we do it? How can we have a circular economy? How are we ever going to manage this? That book's there to reassure you. Three excellent recommendations for everyone's reading lists there. Uh, my next question for you is if you were prime minister for one day, what one thing would you change? Well, it, I would like to say, a clear net zero plan, but um, because obviously that's our most pressing need. Obviously, we can't. We, we, we that that is the thing that the world needs above every, anything else. But you've only given me one day, so I'm not sure that would be doable. So I will say proportional representation to fix our democracy and voting system, because that's quick. We could do it in a day. It's far reaching, and it would allow us that toehold into democratic politics to to make our views better known and and to actually be able to get on with doing everything else so that's the that's the crucial thing i think my penultimate question for you is who is your favorite historical figure am i allowed a politician absolutely and they are safely dead so that is it is historical um my 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 kind of hero is clement attlee um, because he came into power at a point where it it must have looked like we were in a really dreadful situation. We'd spent all our money and more on the war. But his view was that if we could pour resources into winning a war, we could equally take those resources and instead of, say, fighting an extra year of the war, pour it into um, rebuilding society in a better way. So, so he came into power with this huge budget deficit, but he didn't say, "Well, I haven't got any money." He said, "Well, we have to invest in order to, in order to make society better." And and he did make society better. Okay, it didn't it it didn't last forever, but it lasted for a good couple of decades. And then my final question for you is: Who in the Green Party inspires you the most? Well. I'm afraid it is Caroline Lucas. I know everybody says Caroline Lucas, but but uh, her hard work and common sense, I think, particularly her her common sense, the way that she can translate our uh, our policies and our views into into something that really chimes with what what everybody thinks. Um, but also, I would I would single out um, Natalie Bennett for oratory. I mean, to hear Natalie give a speech and to to watch as you're as you're brought along on this wave of you know she 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 tells she tells a story with a speech and so I could learn an awful lot from from listening to Natalie um, but could I just mention one other person a local person Andrew Stringer was the first green councillor on Mid Suffolk District Council exactly 20 years ago and he's now part of a team of 24 and for getting things done in a left field kind of way. Andrew Stringer is an absolute inspiration and I just wish he was better known. Also, he has lovely, um, lovely dress sense. He has the best tweed jackets I've ever seen. Excellent shout out for Andrew there. I'm sure that will help get him better known. Um, that's uh, everything I've got to ask for you. So um, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks, Chris.
So that was my interview with Helen Geek, who is standing for the internal communications coordinator position in this year's GPEX elections. There is one of the candidates standing, which is the job share team of Alastair Binney Lubbock and Laura Eckert. You can find the interview I did with them on the our YouTube channel. Uh, the best way that you can make sure you don't miss out on all of the interviews and videos we put out is by hitting subscribe. Whilst you're scrolling down and hitting subscribe, please do let us know what you thought of this conversation in the comments down below. And if you are able to, please do head to bright dash green bright-green.org forward slash donate and set up a regular donation so that we can continue to put out videos like this and everything else that Bright Green does. So that's all from me for today. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you all very, very soon.